murdered, when people are being raped, being taken hostage, and we will sit aside and say nothing? Even if there is a breach in the fence and a terrorist comes into Israel, normally it's something that the army is taking care of. But this time it was different. It was not stopped. Something here was weird and strange, and it stinks. Journalist Efrat Stenningsen diende zelf in het Israëlische leger en was 7 oktober jongstleden de eerste Israëliër die hardop en op sociale media uitsprak wat velen dachten. De aanval van Hamas op Israëlische doelwitten en burgers was niet alleen ongelooflijk wreed, maar ook vreemd en verdacht. Hoe konden Hamas-terroristen zo gemakkelijk de permanent en zwaar bewaakte grens doorbreken? Een vraag die gewaagd is bij dit buitengewoon gevoelige thema. Maar we gaan hem niet uit de weg. Want Efrat kwam helemaal Tel Aviv naar Nederland om te spreken en te zeggen wat gezegd moet worden. Hoe lastig en pijnlijk het misschien ook is. Efrat. Hi. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, although the circumstances under which we're having this conversation are obviously very grim mm -hmm. and dark and sad, I must say I'm still pleased to uh, be able to have this conversation with you. Um, I think a lot of our viewers will know who you are, um, but many won't. Mm -hmm. So before we dive into the hard stuff, could you just briefly tell us something about who you are, sure. where you come from, what you do? Sure. So I'm, I'm an Israeli. I'm based in Tel Aviv. Uh, I'm basically an Israeli that cares about Israeli lives. I'm an independent journalist for the past uh, two, three years since COVID started. Um, I'm actually a former chief marketing officer in global companies for the past 20 years with experience in tech and marketing. And um, today I write for a newspaper in Israel and I have a podcast of, of my own and I produce content both in Hebrew and in English. I'm also the co-founder of a community of CMOs like myself in Israel of 150 CMOs. So um, yeah, I left that part of my uh, career, the, the CMO part. Was when, that during COVID? Uh, that was, no, actually a, a year ago, I oh. left it completely. Mm -hmm. I'm still the co-founder of uh, the CMO community. Um, so I have my own business uh, on top of being a journalist, but I'm not no longer a CMO of a company, of any company. I'm an independent uh, and I work uh, with partners. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I'm not a security expert, right? But I'm the boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. I, I come here with common sense and the pursuit of truth, which is what I do in my journalistic work. As much as it may be unpopular, I care about uh, Israeli lives and I care about Palestinian lives as well. Um, innocent citizens never benefit anything from wars. And so I spoke out last Saturday when this, all, this war started uh, quite early on. Um, I recorded this video and since then it blew yeah. off. Uh, I created a lot more content in the past about yeah. other topics. But what when kind of topics? I cover topics related to climate, to COVID, to uh, geoengineering sometimes. CBDC is one of my uh, topics that I really specialize in. Um, and I cover everything that I see that is a corruption or an atrocity of the state against the people. That's what I care about. You know, if I see a manipulation or, or, <laughs> or an atrocity, I, I should say, I should be in pursuit of the truth and try to expose whoever is doing something and to whom and why. And so that's what I'm in pursuit of. Obviously, we have always more questions than answers, but at least some people are... Uh, taking that as their mission to try and expose some of the things that are happening around the world. And so my, my position is leading me naturally to very inconvenient questions uh, that no one wants to talk about. And I'm, I'm asking those questions for, for those who can't, mm -hmm. for those people who may not have a voice right now, and for all those Israelis who may not feel safe 
right now because of everything that's happening. And they need to know how to rearrange and regroup themselves in order to protect themselves in light of the war that we are in. So for me, this is why I speak out right now. I personally also know families and friends who are burying their loved ones as we speak, or during this week they have buried their loved ones, um, or their loved ones are still missing. And this is a tragic time for all Israelis and Hamas. And I want to say this out clearly, Hamas for me is a terrorist organization, full stop. There, is no, there are no questions about that. Uh, I needed to clarify that because the fact that I may not immediately take a stand to here or there uh, may have people mistake that I think that there is any legitimation to Hamas, and there isn't. It's a terrorist organization and it shouldn't, shouldn't exist. Uh, now, I served in the army 25 years ago, just like any other um, Israeli young woman or man. When we turn 18, we are recruited to the army. Uh, so I served two years in the army and I was in the intelligence forces. Uh, I was just a plain soldier, right? I wasn't an officer or wasn't a, any expert, but those two years in the army have allowed me to understand. I was uh, based in the Gaza envelope area, right in the, there's a base called Erez base. Uh, it's the Erez crossing between Gaza and Israel. That's where I was based for two years. And so I have my basic experience in understanding what the processes are, what the drills are, what the layers of protection are in that area, what are the processes that need to be executed when something happens around the fence? So you know, you know all that? You have that experience? I know it because I've done it, mm -hmm. right? So all, it was 25 years ago, and I know that many things have changed in those 25 years, but if they have changed, they have definitely proof. changed for the better because yeah. we have technology now that we didn't have 25 years ago. Mm -hmm. In my recent interview, I, I mentioned that when I served, there was no internet as part of the service, as part of the military service. Uh, it was 1998. But so, so when, what we did is mostly with phones and reporting face to face to each other, and it still worked. Yeah. And there were many drills that were in place in order to make sure that mm -hmm. things don't escalate. Today, there are many other things that didn't exist then and still we saw what we saw. Yeah, so how did you so, experience um, Saturday, October the 7th? Right. I mean, you live in Tel Aviv, yeah. right? So how did you first find out there was an attack going on? How does that work? Did you get an alert on your phone, a siren, um, so I was Twitter, or? Woken up by a siren, a very strong siren. I was sleeping and it was 6 a.m. and I was woken up because the siren was very strong and it's not common that Tel Aviv has sirens. It means that there is an attack on Tel Aviv, and Tel Aviv is the center of Israel. So I woke up like that, and uh, soon after we heard the bangs, meaning that rockets were fired uh, towards uh, the center of Israel. And then obviously you check the news to see what happened, why. And you start seeing reports, not, not necessarily the mainstream, obviously the mainstream media would say that there are rockets, but there was not much information going out from the mainstream media about what's happening in the Gaza envelope area, the, the villages, yeah, mm -hmm. around the Gaza Strip. But did you get any information? But then on you Twitter start seeing all the the personal testimonies coming from the field, from mm -hmm. the people who live in in those areas, reporting that they are in their shelters, that they are hearing um, terrorists walking around the, the villages or in their houses, starting to create atrocities, burning houses, taking people hostages, raping people, murdering people, really descriptions that I don't want to get into because it's very difficult and there is enough material about it online. People have seen all, all week and they can see if they choose to. I personally choose not to get too close to it because it's very, very difficult to digest. But a lot of bad stories and bad images were coming out so were the you area. shocked? Did you have a clear... We were shocked. I was yeah. shocked. Everyone was shocked. And everyone understood straight away that mm -hmm. this is not something usual. This yeah. is not something that happens. Even if there is a breach in the, in the fence and a terrorist comes into Israel, normally it's something that the army is taking care of. 
that is being controlled very quickly, that people in the villages that are living there know how to protect themselves, they may have weapons, they may... It would be stopped mm -hmm. yeah. normally. Mm -hmm. But this time it was different, it mm -hmm. was not stopped, and we kept on receiving the testimonies from the ground, from people that are stuck in their shelters, and are experiencing, obviously, fear, shock, and, and tragedies, but also no one is coming to help them. They are calling out for help to the police, to the army, to friends, to other people. No one is getting yes. to them. But I can imagine that in the beginning, you you just, you're just overwhelmed. You see all these horrible images, and you see nobody's helping them. Um, when did the thought come into your mind that there might be something else going on? When did the first suspicions arise in yourself? After two, three hours passed and there is no help, that's it. It's enough for me to understand. So if it started at 6 a.m. and we're at 8, 9 a.m. Mm -hmm. and nothing happened, my, all my flags were already up. Yeah. Something, something is really wrong here. And then we started receiving reports from a party, a big rave party, an outdoor party, music festival that was down in that area. Three, more than 3,000 people in that music festival were celebrating and were partying and were dancing with music during that time because it started at night and it was supposed to be until, mm -hmm. you know, the day after. And the terrorists apparently arrived to that area of the music festival and they were literally butchering the people. So they were uh, running around to um, to chase them, and then they were closing off of them, and then they started just spraying and killing people, and then they uh, they um, took hostage everyone that were not that was not killed, including young women on their own, including men, including then they they took kids and babies and grandparents from the villages, they took them hostages into the Gaza Strip, and that was going on for five to six hours mm -hmm. without any response from the defense forces. Yeah. And that is very not typical mm -hmm. for yeah. the Israeli defense forces. I think you don't even have to be an Israeli living in Israel to find that suspicious. I think that yeah. a lot of people around the world, they were also following the news, of course, through social media. And um, I think there were a lot of people who, at a certain point, also became suspicious because we all know how effective and advanced the Israeli uh, security apparatus is. Um, so there was suspicion brewing in a certain part of the population. Of not with everybody, of course, but um, with, there were people who were suspicious. And at a certain point, you were one of the first people to voice those suspicions. Um, you made a video, um, you voiced your suspicions, you asked some serious questions, and you put that on Twitter. Yeah. October 7th, 2023. This is Afat Fenningson, and I'm here to share an update from Israel-Hamas war, which started this morning. I'm going to share some key details and concerns, mostly based on Israeli citizens' voices from the ground and based on official statements. Personally, I served in the IDF 25 years ago in the intelligence forces. There's no way, in my view, that Israel did not know of what's coming. A cat moving alongside the fence is triggering all forces. So this? What happened to the strongest army in the world? How come border crossings were wide open? Something is very wrong here. Something is very strange. This chain of events is very unusual and not typical for the Israeli defense system. Israel knows Hamas really well. Yeah. Israel has intelligence over what's happening there. That's why it sparked me, because I know the Gaza Strip. I know Hamas. I know uh, that's, what, that's what my service was about. So I said, it couldn't be. They must know. They must know I've seen it. I've seen it before. It cannot be that an event like this is escalating and going out of proportion so quickly and there is no response for so long. Something is not normal here. Mm -hmm. And that's why I had to say it. Yeah. And I want to add one more detail that I forgot before. Another um, 
explanation that is coming out in the last few, that came out in the last few days again which was not verified by the uh, official channels but it was air force pilots that were tweeting on the on their twitter that they were up in the air fighting and protecting already 45 minutes after the breaches mm -hmm. the citizens on the ground living in the all the villages around the gaza strip reported that there was nothing in the air Mm -hmm. They didn't see any helicopter, any jet, nothing during that time. So 45 minutes at 6.45 a.m. they were already in the sky fighting. They, the, the airport pilot, pilots are writing it on their Twitter. And that is not right according to what we know from the people on the ground. So why, why no. this contradiction between because the, the versions? Because they were in their shelters and in their homes locked up. No, I mean, no, not everyone was in their, their shelters. But people, they know, they yeah. hear the helicopters. Yeah. There was nothing in the yeah. air. Yeah. Yeah, so the response was very, very slow. They slow were Slow and to, strange. For hours they were able to kill and slaughter. Correct. And do the most horrible things. Horrible uh, things. We must repeat this because that was a barbaric act. Yeah. Okay, it was a massacre. It was a slaughter of proportions that I have not seen in Israel, I think ever, I don't know. It's no. very, very, very extreme. No, I fully agree. We um, Both things can be true at the same time. I think yes. horrible things, gruesome, horrible things have happened on October 7th, committed by Hamas. Uh, but that does not exclude uh, asking questions about how this could have happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, concerning the slow response, apparently even Hamas, uh, at least one Hamas fighter, was surprised at... No, fighter, terrorist. <laughs> One, uh, how, uh, at least one Hamas terrorist was, uh, was surprised at how slow uh, the Israeli uh, army responded. Um, one terrorist, after being captured, gave his testimony, and we're going to look at that. Shomer Mechabel Hamas Lechoker Shvuim, it conanu be Meshach Termi Shana, a woman saying that the Umshul Yeches in war be April, Sof April, Alpine Mesrivish time. ואחד, אחד, אלף ומאה ואחת עשרה טילים, התכוננו במשך יותר משנה. ההפגנות בישראל באמצע השנה עודדו אותנו. עכשיו, עברו חמש שעות עד שירו עלינו, לפחות בגזרה שלו, בקיבוץ רינזה, מדובר על מפקד חוליה. היינו ערוכים עם אלף לוחמים, זאת אומרת, הם פרצו אלף לוחמים, ועשינו חמש עשרה פרצות בגדר. הוא ידע שהדפה, הדרך שישראל רוצה, או מתכננת, או חושבת שחמאס מתכננת, זה שתיים או שלוש פרצות, עשינו יותר. היינו בהלם. שצה"ל לא מחכה לנו. זה המשפט הכי חזק, צריך להגיד, זה מחבל שנחקר אחרי שהוא נלכד כאן בישראל. מחקד חוליה שנחקר. אגב, בציוט שלו אני ראיתי תמונות שאני לא יכול לפרסם אינפוזיות. Yeah, I can imagine you were surprised as well. To read, um, to see this testimony, yeah. But the army must have been somewhere, or some units must have been somewhere. Um, what's the explanation given by the army itself for why it took so long to respond? They haven't yet given a good enough explanation for us to explain why it took them so long. Uh, because they say that they're uh, busy fighting at the moment and when we are, con we are finishing with the war and, and finishing fighting, we will uh, investigate this thoroughly and we will come back with answers. However, um, what they did say is, hold on, I want to... I want to say it correctly. Okay, that Gaza, the Gaza division, there is a whole division of troops that is supposed to be positioned around the Gaza Strip, it was moved to the Judea and Samara area, which is around Bank? Jerusalem, the, the West Bank, that's mm -hmm. correct. Entire battalions, some of the most professional in the IDF, were moved from the Gaza Strip to secure outposts or settlements mm -hmm. in Samaria and, and uh, secure a member of the parliament in Hawara, which is another Palestinian village. So the forces that were supposed to be positioned on the ground were taken elsewhere. They're talking about 60 to 80 percent of the, the number of the yeah. people that were supposed to be there were moved to another area. So we're, there were not enough soldiers there to protect. Okay, we know that. We also know that it was holiday. This was a Saturday and a holiday, so maybe many of the soldiers were also dismissed to go home and, and not be there in the base. Um, 
But at the same time, we have a message from the spokesperson of the IDF from two days ago saying that they didn't have an understanding of such a big event that is going to happen. There were certain signs. They're saying that they did have certain signs the night before it happened, but not, but not uh, uh, for such a move nor a warning, and we will thoroughly investigate everything later. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the official words of the IDF spokesperson. And at the same time, we know that uh, the AP, the Associated Press, reported that uh, Israel did have prior intelligence about this from uh, Egypt, through Egypt, which, mm -hmm. which is a mediator. Um, but uh, we also know that the Israeli government has denied it. Yeah. So who what is saying the yeah. truth? We yeah. don't know, yeah. right? So there is official sources from Egypt saying that they have passed some information, official information to authorities in Israel, and then Israel is denying that. Yeah. It could be that the army was actually unprepared. And there is a retired general, his name is uh, Yitzhak Brik, and he warned about uh, the Israeli army being unprepared three months ago. אבל במקביל לירי הזה, שאנשים לא ידעו לאן לברוח כי לא הכינו אותם, הם כנסו לטראומה כי סיפרו להם שהכל בסדר, יתחילו מהומות בתוך מדינת ישראל. היא בשומר החומות. So this was from three months ago, this interview. It's a 25 minute interview online in one of the alternative uh, media channels, but he also have been saying this for many, many years, this specific person. Uh, Itzhak Brick, and he said recently that uh, Gadi Eisenkot, the former IDF chief of general staff of the army, fought to hide his report on the IDF's unpreparedness for war. Mm -hmm. Brick said that Israel is not ready for an all-out war and laid out the reasons for it. He explained many times why the army is not well prepared to handle such a scenario that could happen. Mm -hmm. And here we are, and a scenario like that did happen. And was the army unprepared? Maybe. Maybe it's one of the explanations. Maybe what he said was true. I don't know, but he was advocating for this for a long time, and he was in touch with all the high levels of command in the Israeli um, regime. And how is he uh, viewed at this point in Israel? So, so that's a good question because normally he would not be welcome on uh, media studios, mm -hmm. mainstream media studios. Some of them would host him, the smaller ones. But now that this has happened, they all of a sudden invited him to come to the largest mainstream media outlets and speak. They mm -hmm. give him a voice now, they give him a stage, yeah. they want to hear him because all of a sudden what he was saying for a long time is actually happening yeah. and they want to learn from him. We don't have any answers. Um, it could actually be a unprecedented failure um, without any intention. It's possible um, if that's the case. If there's a, uh, an, um, satisfying explanation that would put the thing to rest, but we also have to take into account that it's possible that there are other motives involved, um, that people knew about it, and for some reason they let this happen. Um, we don't know, it's possible, um, and I don't want us to get lost in a geopolitical swamp, uh, so, um, but what could be a motive or motives for allowing this to happen? Look, it's a very tough question because the answers for this are merely speculations. Mm. If I knew the actual why, uh, then I guess other citizens would have known as well. And me, just like everyone else, I'm another citizen that can only guess why something like that would have happened. And one of the things that seem very uh, logical to me is that Hamas, being a terrorist organization that have been growing for many, many years 
right next to us and is expanding and growing in strength and becoming more and more popular uh, within the Gaza Strip and, um, and is activating more and more horrendous acts towards Israel and their hatred is just growing all the time, it's time to take them down. Mm. And I think Israel, Israel needed a justification to go and take down Hamas because Hamas has such a sneaky or um, nefarious way of working that they hide inside civilian um, spots like mm -hmm. hospitals, uh, like churches, like, uh, like uh, schools. They have their bases and their operations done from within civilian places meaning that to take out Hamas, you will most probably have to hurt some civilization as well that is innocent or, or that doesn't have anything to do with what Hamas is doing. Mm -hmm. And so you really do need a good justification to go and take down the whole thing. Yeah. It's, it's, it's also very difficult. And so I don't know if, if, uh, if th this is definitely a justification to take down Hamas, right? But uh, the world needs to see how cruel this organization is, how dangerous this organization is. Uh, another possible why is maybe to have a hostage deal mm -hmm. between uh, Israel and Palestine. And um, they have taken a lot of hostages. And one of the first thing the Hamas spokesperson said after this has happened, I'm talking about few hours after it happened, after they took hostages, Maybe that's a good excuse to start talking about an exchange uh, of hostages deal. And so maybe their whole thing was just to come in in order to take hostages, in order to do this kind of deal, in order to perhaps advance some peace process between Israel and, uh, and Palestine that would require Israel to release some very dangerous um, prisoners from Israeli prisons, that, Hamas uh, Israeli people. citizens wouldn't, uh, wouldn't accept that if, if there wouldn't be... Uh, and again, like and now people can look at what I'm saying and say, she's no expert, what does she know? I'm speculating as a citizen, everyone thinking what I'm thinking, why do we need to go through all of this? Yeah. What is happening yeah. here? Yeah. I don't know. We are indeed speculating right now, uh, but your initial video on Saturday, there was very little speculation in that video. Uh, you just raised questions, um, rightly so, I think so. You were one of the first, but you were not uh, the only one. There were uh, quite a few Yes. First. Um, one of them was this former Israeli soldier. אוקיי? Okay? מבלי שאנחנו לא נדע מזה. התצפיתניות יושבות בבונקרים ארבע שעות, הן לא יכולות לעשות ככה. הן מול מסך. לא יכול להיות מצב, שום מצב, שהיו מעירים אותי בלילה על יונה, על חסידה שהתקרבה לגדר, על, 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 על מקק שעבר מתחת לגדר, היו מקפיצים את כל הגזרה. איך נכנסו עם טרקטורים? What is the reaction to videos like this by the media, politicians? Right. Is, it, is it talked about? Is it ignored? What's the, how do people respond to videos like this? So I think we need to distinguish between the public discussion and the mainstream narrative and what the authority messaging is through the mainstream media because they're two separate worlds. And in the public discussion, thing, things like that happened very often mm -hmm. and people are uploading to social media their opinions, their speculations, their questions, uh, their testimonies from the ground, while in mainstream media they try and prevent from doing anything like that, and they're only obviously quoting uh, the, the official sources without giving or providing any answers. They're starting to ask more questions, but very, very slowly. Yes. And so uh, the reaction is, is, is mixed, because the public is speaking and the authorities or the mainstream media don't want them to speak so much. And therefore they have started to come out 
and silence those kind of voices. Mm -hmm. Maybe not this specific lady that you've seen because she is only asking questions, but there are people that took it even a step further and pointed that it's possible that there may have been an act of betrayal here from within side the, the defense forces to allow something like this to happen. And the fact that people were even daring to, uh, to say that maybe there was a betrayal here, mm -hmm. that triggered, I think, an even harsher response from the mainstream media in Israel to try and uh, silence the, those kind of voices. Yeah, <clears throat> so there's an important distinction, eh? just raising questions, like how can this happen? I been in the army, I've seen how it works, and actually pointing fingers. That's one, taking it one step further. Um, not very... Not very happy. Not very happy with no. the, the pointing the fingers. Yes. Um, let's see how they respond to people who dare to do so. It started in posts מאשימים את צהל ואת השב"כ בשיתוף פעולה עם המתקפה של חמאס. אני חוזר, ישראלים שטוענים שאנשי צבא ושב"כ סייעו לחמאס, אני לא יכולתי להאמין שיהיה מישהו שיקנה את הרעל הזה, אבל הפוסטים האלה מקבלים מאות אלפי שיתופים. זה לא נתפס בעיניי שבזמן שמתינו מוטלים לפנינו אלף מתינו, ובהם גם קצינים בכירים ואנשי שב"כ שמסרו את נפשם, יש ישראלים שמאמינים שאנשי שבק וצהל הם אלה שסייעו לחמאס לרצוח, לחטוף ולהתעלל בבנות ובבנים שלנו? אני לא יודע מה התקלקל באנשים האלה, אולי בנו כחברה, אבל כשאנחנו בעיצומה של מערכה מהקשות שידענו, להצביע על אנשים מתוכנו כעל בוגדים, להמשיך ולקרוע אותנו דווקא ברגע שבו אנחנו צריכים להתאחד, זה כשלעצמו בגידה, בגידה ברוח הישראלית. ומי שמפרסם את דברי הבלע האלה, או משתף אותם, הוא בעצמו משתף פעולה עם האויב. Yeah, that sounds pretty harsh. Um, the media obviously doesn't like people um, asking questions. Well, he's not talking about the people asking questions, he's talking about people, people blaming... actually saying that people in the army might have done so and so. Colluded. But it does set a tone, of course. Huh? Yeah. It does set a tone. Also for people like you, I can imagine. Um, did you receive... I'm on uh, the soft scale. You're on the soft, exactly, yes. you're on the soft side, but when the tone is set, people tend to blur the line and yeah. throw everything on one, uh, one big pile. Um, did you re receive a lot of hate or backlash after your videos and your, um, your talks in the media on this subject? So I mostly received uh, encouragements and good feedback of way to go, everyone's thinking this and you're the ones saying it. But there was obviously groups of people that didn't like the fact that I was asking questions. And yes, I, was, I am being personally attacked uh, online these days for the past three days by some Israelis and also some people overseas that uh, are doing complete ad hominem attacks on me to just try and discredit me and delegitimize me. Um, they don't have any substance to what they're saying in terms of claim, the actual claims that I'm making or the actual questions that I'm raising. They're not talking about them. They're mostly talking about me and my credibility as the person bringing up those questions. And so it's very hard to create any discussion. It's not hard, it's, not, it's impossible to create discussion because there is, no, there is nothing to talk about. It's only defamation. If we stop talking, then we just give power mm -hmm. to that culture of silencing everything that doesn't go along, doesn't go in one path. And we've seen it in the last three years. We're not, it's not, uh, it's not uh, foreign to us to silence anyone that doesn't go along with, the, with what the institution wants us to go along or with the mainstream narrative. And asking questions is considered to be bad. Now, I totally get it that emotionally, from an, emotion, uh, from a, an emotional perspective, it is a difficult thing to do to ask those questions. But it, it is needed for some of the people and we cannot, we cannot, <laughs> we cannot silence anyone. It's, it just goes against nature. 
And the more you will silence people, the stronger they will yell out their pain and their questions. And you, you just can't do that because not everyone is the same. We are different as, as human beings. We're different indiv individuals. We have different needs, different emotions. Not everyone is operating the same. Plus, it's okay to be suspicious of the government or the institutions when, for example, COVID happens and we know that they had some malintent or they have done things wrong or there were certain policies that were not to the benefit of the people. So that it was okay to be suspicious of them then, but it's not okay to be suspicious of them now, especially when such failures are being discovered, when people are being murdered, when people are being raped, being taken hostage and we will sit aside and say nothing, someone will need to give some answers in order to be judged for it and, 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 and go home or even go to prison, I don't know. But it, it just does not make sense to keep quiet in the face of such atrocities. You are speaking out in the media. Um, but how difficult is it for an average Israeli who is not uh, speaking out in the media, who does not wish to speak out in the media, but who might have these questions and these suspicions. How difficult is it to raise these uh, questions and suspicions with friends or family, considering both the absolute horror that happened, but also um, because I can imagine that the IDF, the army, and the security apparatus in Israel is highly esteemed and mm -hmm. it's considered to be the protector of the Israeli people. Um, I can imagine that it is very sensitive if you have these suspicions to, to talk about it with your friends or family because, you know, you have this um, fear of being an outcast, I think. So another point you need to know about the IDF, not just that it's esteemed in Israel, well esteemed, it's also our children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Who yeah. are the soldiers? Yeah. They are our kids. They're 18 to 21 year old young kids that yeah. we sent to the army to serve there to protect us, yeah. right? I did it, many people did it because it's our duty and that's what, what, what we do as Israeli citizens. And so going against the army is not something that you do. I'm not going against the army. These are some of my friends or yeah. some of those kids of my friends. Why would I? I'm not, it's not about them. It's about the higher up levels mm -hmm. that should have done something about this and didn't. So on. So, what I want to say here, here's where I'm going with this. At this kind of time, you have to be sophisticated enough to hold a complex situation. At the same time that you are raising questions, you are also being sensitive to the fact that your kids are sitting there in the army. And obviously, as an Israeli, the one thing you want to do is help those people now. You want to help the people in need, you want to help the people that were injured, and you want to help those soldiers that need the support right yeah. now. And you do that. Yeah. So when you come to speak with your friends and family to your question, you have to hold that level of, of compassion and understanding. Do most do all people do that? I don't know, but I can tell you that some people that are asking questions, again, are getting the same responses of, is this the time to ask the questions? Maybe you should put that aside now and not ask the questions. It's, it's not convenient. This is another way to divide people, right? Between shut up and do this or, or do that or, or be yourself and, and express your pain and your need to speak out. It's not, easy, it's not an easy um, situation right now, for sure. It's, it's very complex. It's not, it's not easy. There is a lot of divide because of that yeah. polarity, and there is a lot of hatred, and but even, people go even, against each other. Yeah, but even um, choosing um, As, to not pick sides, exactly, that's being also attacked. considered to Correct. pick a side. You know, it's, Correct. Uh, if you if you you have to be well, pro not gonna, yeah this yeah. or pro that or yeah. anti this or yeah. anti that, and if yeah. you're not what people expect you to be, you are not okay. Yeah. We've seen it in the last three years with with COVID. We see it with other uh, crises or agendas that are being rolled out, like climate. Are you pro? Or are you anti? You always have to be here or there because this is the classic way to divide people. It's divide and conquer. You, if you are being put into a group, 
it's much easier to classify you and then it's much easier to let the two groups fight between them while they don't look up to the other forces that be that are trying to manipulate them. Yeah. So that's a classic way to try and manipulate people. And while we are fighting amongst us, we are being distracted from other important things that we may need to, to pay attention to. Exactly. And we're not paying attention to other things. Now, my friend, Dr. Ahmed Malik, he's a, he's a doctor in the UK, he put one of my videos and I talked about the fact that I find compassion and empathy for the Palestinian people who are innocent and are being, you know, hurt at the moment in the thousands. And obviously, I find the same compassion and empathy, if not more naturally, to the Israeli people that are being hurt. And, and I said that out loud. So I'm not here. I'm not. I'm like, I'm not this group or that group. And he said... It's not about whether you are on Team Israel or Team Palestine. There is, in fact, a third option, Team Humanity, right? So do we always have to pick a side mm -hmm. or can we just be Team Humanity and look for the unity, right? And that's where I want to be, that's where I am, and that's where I think many people are which are willing and capable of letting down their guard and their automatic reactions. Be humble enough to yeah. say, I don't know everything. Maybe I am being manipulated. Maybe someone is lying to me. Maybe something is wrong here and I should stay open to hear all the different information and opinions and then decide for myself what's right and what's wrong and where the truth lies, if ever we, we are able to do that. But I do want to come back to the one point I mentioned, which is important to me, and that's the civilian initiatives that are taking place right now in Israel. That camaraderie spirit that we have in Israel, we're there to support each other in times like these. And there are amazing initiatives that are taking place right now in Israel. And I'm mentioning it because it's not, it's not, um, I'm not taking it for granted. It takes something to be in such a tragedy mode and shock mode and, and trauma and still bring yourself to, to open your heart and just help other people in need. So this is happening and it's happening in volumes right now in Israel and it is moving because it's crossing away all the different groups. You see all of a sudden religious people working with secular people and from this group and that group and they, this is anti this and pro this but they put it aside and they work together for, for the, the common good which is something that really warms my heart and it doesn't happen every day and this is amazing in my, in my eyes and that's where I want to you know, invite people to go. Take that unison, take that synchronization, take that... Um, camaraderie spirit and bring that to your families and communities and circles in order to build something out of this horror that we're experiencing that can bring something good to, to, to life. And obviously we are still in times of war and it's going to take time until this ends, in, in my opinion. Um, and so we have to obviously protect ourselves, but we also have to see how we can do something that is beneficial for other people. Um, and try to make this very difficult time a little bit easier. Thank you very much for a difficult but important conversation, I think. Um, I hope it, it inspires people to talk about these things, not pointing fingers, but talk about these things. I wish you a good trip home. Stay safe. Thank you. Take care of yourself and your family. And I hope to talk to you soon. Thanks for having me, Roy. I really appreciate it and I appreciate the stage because the, the voice of the people of Israel need to be heard right now. Thanks. You may say I'm a dreamer But I'm not the only one I hope someday Bedankt voor het kijken allemaal. Ik hoop dat dit gesprek mensen de moed en inspiratie geeft om in elk geval te praten over deze moeilijke, maar belangrijke vragen. Als je deze uitzending waardeert, deel de video dan met zoveel mogelijk mensen. En overweeg ook om een donatie te doen, want we doen dit echt met een heel klein team. 
We krijgen geen subsidies, dus alle hulp is echt meer dan welkom. Het is een voortdurende strijd om overeind te blijven. Bedankt voor het kijken en graag tot de volgende keer. 